Great. That's a new to them take Chelsea Val Nitsiga song. Molly Swain Nitsiga song. Mantu Sakaiganik Nitotsin. Oh, two Swanig Nitotsin. Hey, we are Otpem Suisquewa Kitsikisikok Meti in space. Space, space, space. I'm your host, Chelsea Val. This is Molly Swain. I was saying that I'm from Lac St. Anne. I'm from Calgary. There you go. Where are you from? Let's do that thing like Dora the Explorer. No, let's not. Wow, that's a beautiful <laughs> place that you're from. I've always wanted to go there. <laughs> Saskatoon. I love it there. I actually do. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit first about our podcast, uh, assuming that you're not a giant, huge, nerdy fan of it yet, um, but will be. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Who couldn't be? Exactly. Possible. So, so Molly, what, what is this podcast, Métis in Space, all about? So Odapemso Esquewa, Kizikizikok, Kizik, Métis in Space is an Indigenous feminist science fiction podcast that Chelsea and I started about, what, seven, almost eight years ago now. Yeah, like forever ago. Um, and in the podcast, we watch TV, movies, occasionally music videos uh, that some in some way feature Indigenous people. Yeah, and so we are, we come from a background of really loving sci-fi, um, but being a little hurt and saddened by some of the portrayals uh, that we get to see about ourselves there, but also just like going back to loving it. So it's it's this like, you know, um, tempestuous relationship. Yeah, sometimes. we're frenemies. We're yeah. frenemies with sci-fi. We really want to love you sci-fi, but you make it hard sometimes. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we watch these shows and then we get together together. We drink a couple glasses of wine and we, we talk about them. We talk about what they did right. We talk about what they did wrong, mm-hmm. everything in between. And then, of course, you know, we take our favorite pieces and favorite things from science fiction and we try to, like, make it our own. Uh, and I think one of our favorite things uh, is world building, right? Science fiction, like, creates these beautiful worlds um, that are really amazing and you, anything can happen in them. And, and we wanted to do some of that as well. But I think first we want to talk a little bit about sort of some of the tropes that we've seen through, like, decades of media that have really sort of cemented what people think about when they think about Indigenous representation in film. Yeah, so we didn't really necessarily go into this with a, with a, uh, a strong expectation of the things that we were going to see. Um, you know, and a lot of this, we were re-watching things that we saw when we were younger, but we hadn't like applied any sort of critical analysis to it. So this was our attempt to do that a little bit more. And we react in real time. So sometimes our reactions are are just, you know, they're really in the moment. And, it, you know, if you think about it later, maybe um, our conclusions might be different or whatever. This isn't peer reviewed journals. This is just us getting together and chatting and recording it. Uh, But yeah, some of the tropes are really hilarious. So we discovered that whenever a native person enters the room, there should be flute music and the cry of an eagle. Yeah. Exactly. Always. Yeah. Occasionally drums. You know, if you've got a big budget, you'll find Mm. you'll find some drums, but flute all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Some sort of musical um, intro to indigeneity is always there. So this is this is what we ask for now. Every time we're somewhere, we're like, okay, here's our here's our here's our introduction track. Please play that. Yeah. That's on our writer. Yeah. (laughs) Um, oh, being able to transform into animals. Apparently, yeah. all Indigenous peoples uh, practice changing into animals, uh, regardless of the culture you come from. Yeah, and just, you know, willy nilly, as, as you wish, you know, like you yeah. just got that power, you can use it whenever we want, for whatever reason you want no consequences, uh, except the consequences if you get in the way of the white main characters, then there's always consequences for you. Yeah, yeah. But otherwise, you know, you're just so one with nature. Very one with nature. And that's, that's one of the things that we've really discovered too, is that um, almost all of these portrayals sort of put Indigenous peoples in a different category. So there's, you know, we're not magic, and we're not scientific, we're not science, we don't science, we don't magic, we're somewhere in the middle in this sort of, you know, yeah, at one with nature area yeah. that nobody else seems to inhabit, except for when they want to go on a spirit quest or something, when yeah. they want to become us. Yeah, which is, that is another huge trope that we found is white people and particularly white men becoming more Indian than the Indians. Right. So they'll find some Indigenous person who's willing to basically guide them uh they're having some kind of problem and usually this involves some kind of like vision quest or you know that lasts 45 minutes it's a montage it's always a a montage yes and it's never like not much time passes even within the montage right go from like zero to 60 in terms of like your spiritual awareness you're like white to the most indigenous person that ever indigenized anything yeah in like yeah 60 seconds yeah And, and once you've reached that point you are it. You are the one, you make the decisions, you know what's best for everybody, and especially what's best for the Indigenous people. Yeah. But more importantly, you, as the white main character, have grown and learned. Yeah, and, and you don't need perspective. you don't need your Indigenous mentor uh, after that as well. They just sort of like disappear once they've done their job of, of helping a white person self-actualize. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's the trope of 
uh, you know, the white person encountering a primitive indigenous species, maybe on an alien planet or something, and those aliens thinking that they're a god. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah, that happens even now, surprisingly often. And then, you know, if you're if you're a good white person, you will, you know, try to correct uh, these primitive indigenous people, um, or you just ride with it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I keep waiting to like walk into a Safeway or something and having everybody just be like, here, take all the food. You are clearly a god. Because oh then I could great. actually afford some good steaks. That would be awesome. That like, would be if great. You, if you could flip that around. And it oh, was I, like, yeah, it'd be great. You walk into like an all white space. Oh my gosh. Like, you you are our god. You. <laughs> We're not worthy. Yeah, it hasn't happened yet. But Kiss my baby. If anything, we are optimists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other, uh, another big trope that we encounter is sort of the way that uh, all of these portrayals um, deal with Indigenous women. Yes. Uh, really, really poorly. Either the Indigenous woman actually has no lines at all. And that, that is totally common. Silent. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just nothing. Doesn't say a word. It's just there to be either pretty or stoic, um, either a victim or like, you know, lusted after. Yeah. We also found that for the most part, indigenous women, you'll find any excuse to be hypersexualized. Yes. Oh so whether that is, um, you know, being sort of the really disposable love interest for like a single episode of Star Trek, for example, mm -hmm. or, you know, just finding any excuse for to have your indigenous woman character take off her clothes. Right. Uh, so that's something that we've really found, but you rarely, rarely find indigenous women who have agency, mm -hmm. who speak and who are really fully developed human beings. Yeah. Um, and, you know, indigenous men, it's sort of the same thing, right? It's you get the either the really uh, savage warrior, the very wise, uh, like old person who's there yeah. to guide the, the white main character yeah. um, or uh, sort of the degenerate, um, you know, dying out, disappearing uh indigenous person or the modern indigenous person who rejects tradition and mocks oh, yeah. it that that is also a very common trope right it's supposed to like subvert some of these uh stereotypes but it just creates another one right L like the idea that you can't possibly be native and exist in the modern world yeah 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 and that all indigenous people are struggling with this that we all have that sort of like that particular brand of internalized racism yes yes, yes. so all of this is to say you know we've watched shows uh it I think the like some from the like the fifties, fifties and sixties, yeah. all the way up until now. And you know, I think one of the the big uh, narratives around you know not only media but sort of society in general is that we're improving, right? We're we're making linear yeah. progress. Things are slowly but surely getting better. Incremental change, etc. And I think one of the things that we've really noticed is that it's not like that at all. There are shows that we've watched in the eighties that do a better job representing indigenous people than shows from the 2010s. Yeah. It's like every time they start to get it right, something happens. And I don't know, like, I, I suppose you could actually do like a pretty in-depth study and, and look at sort of um, what was happening in society at that time, mm -hmm. maybe influence some of these things. Um, or if it's just like the, 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 durability of some of these stereotypes and the way that they're passed down intergenerationally mm -hmm. uh through through media and everything like they, they just keep coming back around and yeah so we kind of see it get better and then ooh, it tanks and it gets a little better and then it tanks and um and so uh, you know for one one season all we focused on was uh content that was either produced by indigenous peoples or mostly starred uh indigenous actors mm -hmm. and so that was that was one way that we, we we wanted to see you know does does that make a difference and how did you find that i found for the most part it does but i think some you know a big part of what i realized sort of with this is it's not enough to just have indigenous actors mm -hmm. you know and i think the indigenous actors that we've seen do the absolute best they can with the material that they have but i don't think even the best actor can take a role that is fundamentally hyper racist and entirely elevated beyond that you yeah. need people behind the camera mm -hmm. you need people in the writers room you need people directing like you need indigenous people sort of at all levels to make you know indigenous representation that really does reflect who we are as peoples yeah and we're really lucky now um because i think more than than ever before we're starting to see indigenous made speculative fiction speculative fiction is science fiction fantasy and horror we're starting to see more and more indigenous people you know behind the camera in front of the camera in the writer's room doing the casting doing yeah, yeah doing yeah. all of it and you can really tell the difference you know you watch like james cameron's avatar and then you go and watch you know something like blood quantum and like the difference is absolutely huge right mm -hmm. like avatar is basically disney's pocahontas like reimagined for the 2000s right saviorism yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so you know Indigenous representation is incredibly important. It's incredibly important that we continue to push for that representation and not just that nominal, like, you know, Adam Beach in, in the Suicide Squad for five minutes oh, before yeah. they get him oh, or whatever. Oh, they did him dirty. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, that, yeah. We can't just have that, right? Yeah. Like, we can't just, you know, settle for that, LOL. Yeah. Um, 
and you know, I think for us having the opportunity to watch through this and really think critically about how this has developed over the course of you know five, six decades uh, has really demonstrated how important that is. Because the other thing that we see, of course, is that the stereotypes that we've encountered basically filter up into mainstream consciousness generally. Yeah, so when you yeah. Encounter people, you encounter those stereotypes yeah. that you see on screen being thrown back at you in real life. Or they they impact uh, they impact policy decisions. They impact, you know, everything, every 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 aspect. So these are not we we can't just not deal with these kinds of stereotypes. They have to be addressed. Um, and the best way to do that is just let Indigenous peoples tell their own stories. And um, you know what I want to see more of is and and what we're seeing. Like if if you look at there's maybe just because it's so expensive to to make films and shows and stuff like that. So we see this happening more with uh with written text and books mm -hmm. and novellas and stuff like that is there's so many more um indigenous stories being told across all genres so it's not just about memoir anymore it's not just about uh you know focusing on uh just bad things that happen like people are writing everything and they're writing from a nation specific context too so if you have like a Haudenosaunee character within a Haudenosaunee story that is going to look really really different than if you have somebody writing from a Cree perspective from the plains and um that nuance is not something that is necessarily um very apparent in 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 most media um this is the other thing that we find a lot with the representation is mm -hmm. it rarely do they even mention what nation the the indigenous character is from you know mm -hmm. and sometimes they will but it's a real throwaway thing and sometimes it's real it's not even accurate to the area that they're in you know little things like this that if you had a native on set from from your area it would, it would be easy to figure it out but it, it'd be like in saskatoon somebody somebody writing a story that just involves like i don't know dene like, of course, there's Dene in, in Saskatoon, there's Dene like everywhere, but it doesn't make sense for that to be like the nation that is holding the stories there. So, yeah. So the other thing that we love about science fiction, as we mentioned before, is the world building, right? You can create this incredible, you know, utopia or this, you know, terrifying dystopia. And you, you know, you can set these stages to work out problems that we're experiencing now. But what would that be like in the future? You know, and so a show like Star Trek, for example, is the perfect example of that, right? It's um, this one man's idea of what sort of a liberal humanist utopia would look like where, you know, everybody gets along, where racial prejudice, where sexism, et cetera, has been extinguished. Right? And, and they don't have to explain how it happens. Nope. There's no like, there's no guide to like how they got rid of racism and sexism and classism and, and money, you know, like this is supposed to be uh, like a, a post-scarcity economy. Uh, and they, they, nobody is like, well, I would really love to watch your show, Gene Ron Mary, but until you explain to me how this is possible, we're just not going to do it. Yeah. So tell me about this beaming. What are the physics? You know, nobody's yeah. asking. I mean, there are, yeah, back. but they're not requiring it first. And no. what we find with Indigenous peoples is when people are asking us, you know, especially in the context of reconciliation and stuff, what do you want? What, no, do, you what want? do you want? And I mean, you know, obviously Indigenous people have been saying what we want yeah. for like, ever it's now. like here's our list yeah right and and, and but then they're like i can't see this list what do you want yeah yeah uh, but with science fiction you know you don't like you start you start at what you've already gained yeah what you like you imagine you, you imagine the best you have it, yeah. all, everything that you could want yeah yeah, yeah. And, and there then, it is your beautiful future and and then you just you just start making it happen now you start taking the steps to make that happen you don't have to explain how you're going to deal with all this stuff first before people will will support it just you 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 have a vision and that's what we're working towards so one of the things one of the overarching tropes not just in science fiction fantasy and horror but in basically all media including the news since colonization began on these lands has been that indigenous people are dying out that we don't have a future we don't get to have a future we don't get to exist in the future we don't get to be in the future and especially not as indigenous peoples right so this is why for us science fiction is a particularly important genre because it allows us to imagine ourselves into a future which is fundamentally an anti-colonial position to take just that we're surviving and thriving in a future as indigenous people is extremely important that we can build our own futures as indigenous people that those futures will look different mm -hmm. in a lot of ways from mainstream ideas of a sci-fi future, yeah. right? So what kinds of technologies do we get to have? Yeah, and you why know? wouldn't those be informed by our own cultural like specificities, right? Like, uh, you know, just, just like you think about so many of the, the things that, you know, the aesthetic of space through sort of a mainstream Western view has a particular look and not just a look, there's, there's a couple of different looks, right? But that's informed by, you know, settler past. And so we also, our aesthetic would look different, right? Like, I mean, if it was Métis space, then 
everything's beaded everything's beaded beaded. there's lots of beep boops (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah, we love a beep boop like low rent sci-fi aesthetic that's some good some good fringe you know red river carts with huge ear like the biggest earrings that you know six feet long trailing behind you. gravity doesn't matter at this point yeah maybe you use your earrings to like to to actually fly around and float around to travel places that would be amazing see see so cool anyway yeah so we just invented that um but so the other thing that we do in the podcast is we we do our own world building we have a Métis in space, space universe universe and time soon to be cinema cinematic universe yeah, yeah. I'm sure somebody's totally. gonna give us like a bazillion the dollars M-I-S-U. yeah <laughs> yeah so we yeah so we get to do that on the podcast too and we get to do that imagining and you know we really want to encourage you I guess like through the Saskatoon Public Library or yeah. wherever you get your your literature and your your film and you know everything that you consume seek out indigenous made media seek out indigenous made sci-fi what is going on what are these futures that we're imagining for ourselves what are the what are the problems in these futures and how are we solving them because i think if there's one thing that is very very apparent in the colonial present it's that the system as it is works the way it's intended but the way that it's intended is fundamentally screwed up yeah 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 so how can we do better how can we solve problems and not just for indigenous people that's the thing too is like we have to remember that the way that capitalism works and the way that you know everything is set up to to politically disenfranchise us and disempower us um that that affects everybody like there might be a few people who who benefit and our love and life and stuff but like honestly even 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 those people you know they're lacking something uh, it's not a system that works for any of us. So this is, you, you don't have to be Indigenous um, to to enjoy this kind of media, to enjoy this kind of thinking. It's 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 a, a different worldview that you can use, you can access maybe to, to imagine your own future differently in a, in a way that perhaps sort of colonial Western thinking doesn't allow you to do. So it's true. Yeah. So go out there, watch some sci-fi, have a great time. And make a new world. And make a new world. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us here on our little snippet of Otpem uh, Suskoyak. It's a Gisigok Metis in space, 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 space.